Are we live now? We are live. Yeah. Okay. So welcome everybody to this uh, masterclass today uh, under the aegis of All India Ophthalmological uh, Society from the AIOS uh, headquarter platform. And this is the UP chapter with us. And this is a masterclass on uh, cataract by uh, the masters uh, themselves who are uh, all with us today. And we have uh, Dr. Harbans Lal, sir, who's uh, uh, joining us very soon. Uh, he is going to be presiding over uh, this session. Uh, and uh, uh, this is uh, just to show the same. So I think I'll just put it on this. So uh, we have uh, Dr. Harbans Lal, sir, president-elect, uh, and also the director of Delhi Eye Center, uh, and co-chairman department of ophthalmology at sir, sir gangaram hospital new delhi dr lalit verma sir uh, president all india ophthalmological society director retina services center for sight new delhi uh, I, I would request uh, uh, we ha also we have uh, i have with me uh, my co moderator professor rajesh sena the honorary treasurer of all india ophthalmological society professor of ophthalmology at konya cataract and refractive surgery services uh, and uh, I would request Dr. Rajesh to please uh, introduce the next two speakers. Well, it's uh, good evening to all of you, and it's a great pleasure and honor to introduce some of the best of friends of mine and excellent FACO surgeons, uh, Dr. Anand Veer Jain, who is a senior consultant, I trust in a Gaziabad, and Dr. Sudhir Srivastava, who is director at Sanai Hospital and Laser Center, Lucknow. Then we also have with us. Uh, uh, Dr. Manish Mahindra, who is director of Therabad Eye Hospital Kanpur. And we also have with us Dr. Anil Srivastava, CEO, uh, uh, CEO and the Chief Ophthalmologist at Rajai Hospital uh, Gorakhpur. And uh, I would, uh, before we begin the session, I would request Dr. Harbanslal, sir, to say a few words. Sir, you're muted, sir. Sir, you're muted, sir. Uh, good evening, everybody. I think it's a very interesting topic, and we have got a wonderful speakers with us. I'm sure every one of us are going to benefit with this. So let's uh, start the program, and uh, let's hope we, everybody a lot, lot more people join it and watch it afterwards. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I would request uh, Dr. Anand Veer Jain to give his first talk, which is on near physiological intraocular uh, pressure phaco emulsification. Okay, I'll start sharing my screen, ma'am. Yes. Is my screen visible, ma'am? Yes. You just have to make it. Yes, perfect. Okay. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, I am thankful to uh, Dr. Arvatlal sir, Dr. Lalit sir, uh, Namta madam and Rajasthan sir for giving me this opportunity as well as Allergan. And I will be speaking on near physiological IOP phaco multiplication. As we all know, high bottle height is equal to high intraocular pressure. And we all are used to working at very high intraocular pressure uh, at a very high bottle height. Uh, so, if we are working at 100 centimeter bottle light, that means we are working at around 70 to 75 millimeter of mercury of pressure in the eye. There are various advantages of working at high, such high intraocular pressure that the surgery becomes fast as well as there are less chances of uh, in, uh, PC rent if we are working at very high intraocular pressure. Now, it has certain disadvantage so, with high IOP phaco such as it can cause optic nerve damage, decreased retinal perfusion, weak zone use can cause fluid misdirection syndrome, as well as there is pain or a reverse pupillary block in case of high myopic patients, and there is increased intercamular turbulence in floppy iris, and it makes our surgery difficult if we are working at very high intraocular pressure. Now, low IOP phacoemulsion is beneficial in falling situations, as glaucoma, Air, uh, high IOP can damage optic nerve, AION cases, IFS cases of patients who are on alpha antagonist drugs, high myopia patient, posterior polar cathet, and a runaway rexus patient. Now, 
a few challenges which we face in doing low IOP circumcision. It should be done by experienced surgeon, should be attempted only after doing um, what I feel is after doing around more than 1000 surgeries. Uh, difficult, there is difficult nucleus rotation due to soft anterior chamber. So we should make adequate main sign season so that it doesn't compress our sleeve. And side port should be non leaking so that the chamber doesn't become too soft. And since we chamber is soft, so we multiply near to the endothelium. So we should use chondritin sulfate based viscoelastics. And moreover, because uh, surgical time is uh, more because we are working at low intraocular pressure. Now, there are certain machines which work on low IOP with almost all advantages of high bottle height uh, FACO. Uh, currently, there are two machines uh, one is Signature Pro, other is Centurion Vision System. And I work on both the machines, and both the machines are equally good. Signature Pro machine has an automatic occlusion sensing technology. It monitors vacuum 250 times per second throughout the surgery. That is, for every four milliseconds, it uh, monitors the vacuum, anticipates pressure changes, and proactively respond to the occlusion breaks, and maintains the chamber during post-occlusion surge. Other machine is with Centurion Vision System with active sentry handpiece. Now here, FACO handpiece has a built-in fluidic pressure sensor. So the pressure sensor is in the handpiece instead of console. So it has become nearer to the eye. And it takes pressure in the real time and communicates with Centurion fluidic management system for real-time occlusion break search reduction. So these two are great machines. Uh, helps us in doing FACO at low IOP because their surge reduction mechanism is great. So now a few videos which I would like to show on low IOP FACO modification. Now, this is the video where I will showing a hard catheter and will show my technique of uh, doing a drill and chop. So this video just to show that we can do a complicated case at low intraocular pressure with ease. Here, after doing the initial steps of echo uh, catheter surgery, I will um, drill a around two millimeter deep hole in the sub incisional area. And this surgery I'm doing it uh, with 2.2 mm incision, drilled a hole. Now I will rotate the nucleus to 180 degree. And now impale the nucleus with a very high vacuum. And place the long chopper in already drilled hole and bring the chopper and FACO tip towards each other. As they come towards each other, I will literally separate them. And the nucleus will divide into two halves and few leathery fibers which remain can be separated by lateral separation. The advantage of this method is that you can use the maximum forces, horizontal force, which is available to us because we are burying chopper as well as faculty very deep into the nucleus. Now we further can divide the nucleus or subchop the nucleus with, with our own technique uh, into smaller pieces, as you can see here. Uh, there is, uh, you can see the surgery is a bit slow because of a uh, soft eye. Now, after dividing the nucleus into small pieces, I am uh, multiplying them at 20 intraocular pressure, as you can see. And practically, there is no surge, so can easily be done. Here, just to, we have to take care that we have to fill the entire chamber again and again with this elastic or conductin based sulfate. We have to coat the endothelium. Okay, easily the surgery can be done. Now, this is another video which I have done of Signature Pro system. Here, I'm using 30 centimeter bottle light, as you can see here. After doing the initial steps of uh, now I am impaling the nucleus and doing a direct chop. Here I am using vacuum of 450 and flow rate of maximum flow rate of 25. The further dividing nucleus into small pieces. Easily able to multiply them. As you can see here, 
and there is no sir lenses play and surgery can be done easily now this is the another case this is a uh, intumescent cathet here i will be using a horizontal chop a demonstrating horizontal chop at low end of low pressure doing the initial step of phaco incision now i will impale the phaco tip Now going below the nucleus and dividing it into two halves with the horizontal chop, easily able to do it at such a low IOP. There is no issue. For the dividing it, and now I am intensifying it at twenty into the pressure at two, and the incision is two point two millimeter, a uh, two point two mm. So as you can. Now this is another case. This is a case of phacolytic glaucoma, and you can see the lytic metal here. Now after controlling the pressure, I will be doing phaco machine at low intraocular pressure, so that we do not damage the optic disc further. Here I will be employing submarine chop, uh, with Dr. Mohanty promotes, Pradeep Mohanty promotes, and will be. Uh, dividing the nucleus into two halves. As you can see, the chamber is soft, so I have to do it uh, slowly. After dividing the nucleus. i will further subchop the nucleus this is a very hard nucleus smaller pieces after further divide nucleus in smaller pieces i will multiply them and the advantage is that you are working at 20 intraocular pressure so no further damage to optic disc you can complete the surgery easily now this is the another case here i was trying to do a puncture excess but uh, i failed uh, excess ran away so with the help of little maneuver i brought it back now but sometimes you have a your day is not good so it extended again here it extended again but now i was not able to retrieve it now i had two options whether to convert into sics or do a phaco low iop phaco because the pressure gradient in anterior chamber and the posterior segment are same so very less chances of pieces nucleus falling into the vitreous in case of uh, in case of pc rent and since the pressure gradient are same so also very less chance of rexes uh, extending to the posterior capsule in these cases and now this is my go to method uh, in case of runaway rexes and easily we can do the surgery as you see here i am using a direct chop here to divide the nucleus for the sub chopping it into smaller pieces
no emulsifying at the nucleus with ease, no issues at 20 intraocular pressure. Is able to place the lens. So these are the cases. And to conclude, I would like to say low IOP FACO emulsion with newer generation FACO machines gives us an excellent option to check tackle challenging cases with ease. I thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Anand Virjain, for that excellent uh, collection of cases, uh, which very nicely highlighted where and when you should do uh, uh, low IOP FACO emulsification. Uh, Dr. Harbans Lal, sir, would you want to comment on it, sir? I think the uh, biggest advantage of this technique is that uh, it gives you the confidence that whenever needed, you can do the low IOP FACO emulsification comfortably. So everybody should practice it, but probably not recommended as a routine. Like if you can do FACO emulsification without doing hydro dissection and hydro delineation, tomorrow if your rotation is not good, hydro dissection is not complete. You know that even if hydro dissection is not complete, you can complete the FACO emulsification. Or whenever you are dealing with the posterior polar cataract or any such situation. So for routine cases, I will not recommend why to operate on a soft eye because 60 to 100 millimeter uh, centimeter of a bottle height is reasonable and patient is not very uncomfortable. But I usually do not recommend more than 100 centimeter of bottle height. But yes, it's a very good idea to have practice to operate on a low IOP and keeping the bottle height 30, 40 centimeter and see how comfortable you feel. So anytime whenever you are operating a very shallow chamber, in a few days back I operated where the chamber depth was only one millimeter, or if it's syndrome, anytime you need it, you should be able to do it. Thank you, Anandvi, for the excellent presentation and very good talk. Thank you, sir. So, very rightly said, uh, it should not become a routine, but only in the cases where, are, where it is indicated, like a runaway rexus, which Anandvi very nicely showed, or a posterior polar cataract, or in cases of zonal dialysis, etc. So, we come to the next talk now, and the next talk is going to be given by Dr. Sudhir Shavaska. And uh, I think you have two talks. So you are taking the first talk. It's going to be achieving quiet eye after cataract surgery. Yes, uh, Dr. Sudhir. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my slides are visible, ma'am? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thanks, uh, AIVS, uh, for or organizing this meeting and uh, Dr. Namrata Sharma, Harbans Lal, sir, and uh, Dr. Lalit and Dr. Rajesh. He just left, I think, because he's in <laughs> travel mode. So uh, thanks, Elargan, also, for organizing this meeting. I think it is first of its kind uh, after a long time in uh, UP chapter. So without wasting time, today I'll uh, uh, share two talks. First is uh, how to achieve quiet eye after cataract surgery because it's very important topic and nowadays we are um, talking about the you know, uh, quality cataract surgery and in quality comfort of the patient and quietness of the eye is very important. And uh, slides. Yeah. So in uh, medical fraternity, no news mean, means good news. So it, it is possible in two ways. Either the patient has run away because he is fed up from your uh, job and or the patient is very happy. Happy means the quiet eye and patient is quite asymptomatic and uh, obviously patient will not, not disturb you. Um, any kind of surgery in the body can create a lot of uh, structural and inflammatory changes. Similarly, in the eye, we get, you know, conjunctival hyperemia, ciliary, circumciliary congestions, corneal epithelial erosions, corneal edema, anti-chamber reactions, and deposits on eye will. And uh, so there are two very important aspects uh, uh, which needs to be, you know, considered is whenever we uh, talk about making the patients quite uh, asymptomatic or making the eye quiet. First is, first is to uh, make take the help of ocular surface. And second is, to control the intraocular inflammations. So my talk will revolve around the two points. So why this uh, ocular surface is important, especially when we talk about the cataract. 
because uh, if we compare the cornea eye and the camera both have uh, similarities and uh, a, for a crisp and clear picture we need to have a clear lens uh, for the camera and for the eye we need to have a crisp and clear shiny cornea and cornea the main enemy of the cornea is the dry eyes and the ocular surface bad ocular surface it it uh, give a lot of you know irritation discomfort and uh, stinging sensations patient comes uh, quite often in the post ops because of these uh, problems so uh, understanding about the dry eye is very important why it is important because uh, if we look and at, at the you know uh, uh, prevalence of this problem in globally it is uh, 5 to 30% of patients are having some kind of uh, ocular surface problem and in india it is around uh, 20 to 40% it means every second patient coming in the chem in, in the hospitals they have some kind of um, ocular problems and uh, regarding the economic burdens unfortunately we don't have indian data but uh, us data says approximately uh, approximately 3.5 billions of uh, 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 means dollars uh, us healthcare spends to maintain the ocular surface and it comes around approximately eleven thousand uh, dollars per patient. So it's a huge, huge you know, uh, economical burden on patients. So similarly, we can understand because we don't have data for India, but we have uh, this kind of burden. And uh, if we go under the classification of uh, 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 dry eyes, then basically uh, uh, due to is important classification and. Basically, we achieve whether the patient is aqueous deficient or evaporative dry eye, and majority of the patients have mixed kind of picture. So, asking these triage, triage questionnaires or using questionnaires and risk factor analysis and different uh, diagnostic tools, which we discuss in the next few slides, what we basically achieve? We achieve uh, to understand about the bad ocular surface. So, uh, diagnostic sequences we have to modulate. And fortunately, we can divide it in two parts. One is non-mandatory test and second is a mandatory test. Mandatory test we can do easily at our clinics. I think every clinic has uh, these are these things. And if, if we are not using it, we must use it like fluorescent staining or different kind of stains, Rose Bengal or Lishmin green, green stain to just uh, understand about the conjunctival surface and corneal surface. Shermer's test to understand about the liquid aqueous production and mebography to uh, know about the health of the mebobin gland. Non-mandatory tests like MMP9 test to understand about the inflammation, then other invasive tests where we need uh, such certain documentation, they are not mandatory. But if you have, you can easily do the documentation on the basis of, uh, uh, on, by using the, these tools. Now we are, uh, uh, majority of surgeons are doing practice at different uh, uh, centers and uh, even the corneal surgeon, they are visiting to different centers. So we can easily make, not even the only corneal surgeon, even the cataract surgeon can make a dry, dry eye kind of kit, keeping the questionnaires and different kind of stains. And if possible, you can keep MMP9 kits to evaluate the inflammation and so on. So you can at least judge the, uh, uh, your patient about the ocular surface preoperatively and even uh, not only in the cataract surgery, but it also helps in the refractive surgery. So different questionnaires, we, when we ask why they are required, because we have to do documentation. Certain patients may have certain, uh, they are, if you do a set lamp examination, you won't find any findings, but the, they will tell, tell about huge, huge means uh, numerous uh, complaints they will say in the clinic. So you have to do, do, do documentation and you can assess the effect of quality of life also uh, on the basis of these questionnaires because it is important to maintain it, uh, do the documentation. Regarding the in, important diagnostic tools is obviously the uh, straining. Straining, uh, uh, one precaution is that uh, don't, uh, you do not use any viscous uh, like we use, often we use any kind of uh, lubricant eye drops because uh, the lubricants has uh, they have uh, uh, mucus agents and you may get uh, altered uh, uh, staining so always use any uh, simple antibiotic eye drop to st dissolve the stains and uh, other stains like leishman green and rose bengal you can analyze the conjunctival surface and shermer's is very st uh, standardized now 
So uh, here again, one point is that don't, uh, don't touch the tip of uh, Shermer's because uh, the oil present in your fingers can alter the readings. These, the, these things are very uh, smaller, smaller things, but uh, it matters a lot in a regular practice. So what we achieve after the question is and assessing the quality of life and doing stains and uh, assessing the tear film makeup time and doing Shermer's analysis. Basically, we only assess the effect of dry eye, not the cause of dry eye. Because, and uh, as we get the bad ocular surface, we start uh, lubricant eye drop. This is not a right way. So we need to understand about the cause also, because some patients of rheumatoid arthritis and the patient with MGT, they may have see similar kind of Shermer's picture. So uh, whether you'll give the same kind of uh, treatment in all patients, it is not true. So you have to uh, know the root of the cause and through, uh, if you want to know the read, root of the cause, then you know, under, you must understand the pathogenesis of the disease. So tear film instability and hyperosmolarity like regarding the inflammation and the corneal and surface damage. Osmolarity is obviously high. When we uh, see any ocular, uh, bad ocular surface, you'll get a lot of you know, uh, uh, floating objects because of the uh, high concentration of the uh, tear film. But if you, uh, several studies have already proven that uh, you'll get the similar kind of osmolarity in dry eye patients and the normal patients. So with this, uh, assessing the osmolarity, after assessing the osmolarity, you cannot judge whether the patient has actual normal kind of you know problem or the dry eye problem but it will definitely give a clue several solutes are there in the lubricant eye drop like glycerol erythritol and l carnitine and glycerol enters in the cell very fast it goes it leaves the cell very fast erythritol enters very fast but it leaves the cell slowly and similar, similarly l carnitine which needs the active transport it enters in the cell slowly and it leaves the cell uh, gradually so we need to have a combination of you know solutes to make a good uh, um, uh, lubricant eye drop regarding that inflammation i'm not going in detail it's a complex theory but a word about the white inflammation because some patients may come with without any redness and without without any you know signs but they may have a lot of symptoms so you have to be very cautious in those patients also if you have MMP9 excess, then um, uh, do MMP9 analysis because uh, it indicates the inflammation. If patient has inflammation, then right uh, from uh, starting, you can start the cyclosporin or anti, any uh, steroidal eye drop along with the artificial eye drops. And if MMP9 is negative, it means the only artificial tears will work. So if patient has inflammatory symptoms, then we can start uh, restasis or uh, uh, cyclosporin eye drops or tracrolimus. But it, the effect comes very slow. So that is why we need a combination of, you know, lubricants and a steroid along with these medicine because it takes months to um, uh, show the effect on the ocular surface. Tear film and instability is because of the mebobin problems and now it is overdiagnosed problem and previously it was not less diagnosed. So for that, we need to understand, we have to examine the set lamp, uh, do thorough set lamp examination to analyze about the blepharitis or you see the vibobil orifices and uh, other things. If patient has a problem, then you can just avert the lid and you can see under uh, any kind of uh, autoref, you can see the infra under the infrared light, you can uh, assess the presence and absence of uh, vibobin gland because presence and absence of glands are very important. And if the glands are present, then you can simply give uh, compress, hot compresses, massages and pulsative therapies and some oral omega fatty acids and other things. So regarding machines are not important. I'm not advocating that uh, every clinic must have, but obviously if have access to this thing, like I have, we have a keratograph. So with these equipments, we can do documentation and the docu documentation definitely um, helps in your long-term practice. So what would be the strategy would be just to supplement the tears like and increase the tear film secretions and preservation. Supplements like uh, is absolutely misnomer because there is no uh, a tear substitute is available because ideal lubricants, they, they must be preservative free. They, they must have water, salts and hydrocarbons, proteins and lipids. And uh, the long surface retention time, osmolarity should be low, pH should be neutral or slightly alkaline, and they must be biological active, but none exist. 
so it's a mis uh, illusion so our lubricants have preservatives electrolytes viscosity agents and osmolarity agents so different kind of uh, you know different problems may we need a different kind of lubricants viscosity agents i am not going in detail because it will that's a full class but uh, preservative is the big problem dk is the most is the most you know uh, versatile villain now we have two rights they are uh, quite uh, surface friendly so the common complaints after cataract surgery is ocular discomfort irritation red eyes and foreign body sensations and the fatigue and quiet eye is it means that we need to have a corneal integrity the cornea must be crisp and clear there must not be any redness patients should have uh, less complaints less irritation and uh, modern uh, surgery requires you know uh, uh, in modern surgery if we want to achieve a good results then we need to have clear uh, less of reactions because any kind of deposits on the eye will can hamper the quality of you know optical out, uh, outcome the because we we are no, no, we are talking about the premium eyewells we are talking about the multifocal eyewells so any kind of deposits definitely will hamper the outcome so this we can achieve by putting non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs and the surface um, keeping the surface uh, uh, normal but again if we uh, uh, use any kind of you know uh, medicine we have to use preservatives so we need to have preservative free medications which not only takes the take care of the ocular surface but it also um, reduces the intraocular inflammation so what are the alternative is the prurite is the answer because it's allergan talk so allergan has a sponsor so i must say but it's a good thing to prurite is uh, ocular surface friendly it has bactericidal fungicidal properties also and it is very less to less talk Uh, toxic um, according to the several studies so important tips to achieve satisfied and happy patients in the post op ccc is not the cur circular curvilinear rexis it is basically conversation always discuss with the patient tell about the surface quality tell about the problem whatever the patient has uh, can correct them do the proper counseling take the proper consent and if patient uh, is having bad surface then you must understand that you may get wrong calculations on biometry then again patient in the post op will show poor healing and the patient will be quite symptomatic and you must be aware about the patient status general status like diabetes and retinal vascular problems of uh, if the patient is on glaucoma medication that's then because of the long term use of medicines patient may have bad surface so if patient is diabetic and retinal vascular problem then you have to control the you know you have to minimize the chances of cystoid macular edema and the mac macular edema in the post op so you have to start non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs at least two couple of weeks prior just to summarize achieving quiet eyes uh, after cataract surgery is very very important and topical and is aid is very important to control the inflammation along with the steroids to achieve quiet eye however the preservatives they are present in the topical formulations can create problems and bak is the uh, the is the biggest villain prurite is a novel alternative uh, uh, to uh, alternative for the chemical preservatives and uh, prurite is found to cause minimal effects on the corneal surface so if we control the surface if we uh, polish the surface if we keep a, the ocular surface well maintained glistening corneal surface uh, and if we control the intraocular inflammation with all these things then definitely we'll achieve a uh, quiet eye thank you very much thank you so much uh, dr sudhir i think uh, this is a very important topic uh, which uh, was to be covered now if uh, you mention a lot of investigations but if when if if a surgeon is sitting uh, say somewhere in a peripheral clinic then to assess for dry eye i think if you do just shermer and tear break up time and maybe just do staining that should be good enough uh prior to doing a cataract surgery because people may not have facility to do a mmp9 question is of course can be instituted but other things you know which are there may not be possible so if these three investigations are done that should be good enough uh, second point that i wanted to say is that never combine a nsa with a lubricant because what happens is that nsa itself will cause a little bit of dryness 
because of the uh, the uh, nature of the drug itself so it is always you know best uh, not to combine them or never combine a say astringent with a lubricant like people tend to give uh, nefazoline or uh, 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 nefazoline kind of a product then it counter they are both antagonistic in action sir uh, your comments on uh, this please I think uh, you know, particularly when uh, these uh, patients are very demanding, so it is good to treat the dry eye, but more importantly, when you do biometry and a pure cratometric and even when you do refraction, if the axis is varying a lot and the readings are not coinciding, instead of having the average, if you see the cratometric chart on any biometer, if there's a lot of variation, this patient is 100% suffering from dry eye. And you definitely need to treat dry eye with the uh, mild steroids like FML and lubricant eye drops and do the repeat the biometry because this patient is going to be very, very unhappy if his biometry is incorrect. And if by any chance you use the toric and patient is not in need of the toric, if you use the multifocal IOLs, so these patients are going to be very, very unhappy. So the premium IOL practice, you must ensure that the dry eye is not causing error in your biometric calculations. So that is even more important. Of course, we need to manage the dry eye beforehand so that post outwardly patient is complaining less. Uh, this is often a question asked that which tier substitute would you start? I mean, of course, um, our sponsors have got a lot of products and they have, you know, CMC, then they would have uh, polyols and gelling agents. So, what which lubricant would you start first, uh, Dr. Sudhir, if you have a patient of dry eye before doing a catalyst? Ma'am, uh, this is a question of okay. an hour because uh, everyone asks about uh, there are a list of you know uh, lubricants available. I think methyl cellulose itself is a good kind of lubricant, but obviously, if we have solutes like glycerol, ethetol, because they basically enter in the cell also. And they hydrate the cell well because uh, less concentrated means the high concentration of uh, tears definitely creates is the main reason for the uh, problem on the uh, ocular surface. So if we not only uh, uh, with methyl uh, cellulose, we are basically taking care of the surface and for the cell, we need these solutes. So adding these solutes uh, like ethetol, glycerol and uh, even the combination because as I said that glycerol enters in the cell very fast and it leaves the cell very fast. Whereas ethetol enters slowly and it leaves the cell slowly. So if we have the combination of these things along with methyl cellulose, then definitely will uh, take care of the surface well. I, I personally feel that the giving the steroids for three, four weeks actually helps the patient much more than the what lubricant you use. Mm. Because that immediately relieves his symptoms and it stabilizes. So I usually use the uh, fluoromethylona, I mean, FML type of eye drops for three weeks and patient within a week is very, very comfortable. Quite right, sir, especially when you are planning a surgery and the patient wants a surgery early. So I think uh, with this, we will move on to the next talk, sir. Yeah, yeah sure. sure. Uh, so, I, I want to add one thing, sir, Herban, sir, and uh, Namrata, ma'am. Uh, we, we must try to keep the number of medications low because a lot of medications also, they are also responsible for you know creating a lot of problems on the surface. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I agree 100% with you. Yes. So, uh, Dr. Sudhir, would you want to take your second talk? Uh, yes. Okay. So, the second talk is on understanding the vectors to negate art art Argentinian flag sign in white cataract. Yes. So um, I think uh, uh, Dr. Anil sir and uh, Manish must be uh, waiting for the talk. <laughs> <laughs> so my topic is understanding vectors uh, to avoid Argentinian flag sign. Uh, but sir, you must be remembering that uh, we had a talk of uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Chaudhary and we discussed in the Goa conference that about uh, these things. So at uh, that time I talked about the vectors. So now, uh, fortunately, I got this opportunity to talk, talk about the vectors. So uh, first thing is that what are the prerequisites for safe ecomulsification? I, I, I think uh, uh, no one will doubt that uh, no one uh, doubt that uh, the CCC is the biggest invention for the phaco surgery because without uh, 
uh, intact capsular access, uh, thinking about the FACO surgery, probably Dr. Anand can definitely do with compromised surgery with the low bottle height, but uh, uh, still Anand will be heroic when he'll get us complete uh, CCC without any compromise with the acute anchors. So, and when we learned uh, uh, FACO, uh, size and shape were not very important because uh, that time we was we, we thought of uh, implanting the lenses and keeping the you know and cataract out and but now we understand about the shape and size these things these things are very important because uh, we are talking about the premium eyewells even with the uh, abrasion free eyewell if you want to achieve the uh, maximum from the lens we have to have a central uh, actually centrally placed eyewell and any rexis should not have any acute angles because acute angles are the area from which the from there the rexis extends uh, from the uh, to the posterior capsule for ideal environment is when the anti capsule is flat and it is possible when you fill the anti chamber tightly with any kind of viscoelastics the lens pressure is normal there is no raised interlenticular pressure and a glow is uh, if the patient has uh, uh, less uh, dense cataract, then you can get an excellent group with the present higher end microscopes, even with the basic microscope. And if you're not getting proper glue, then for the better visibility, you can stain the uh, capsule with a pond glue. But what happens in the uh, intumescent cataract? I think my talk is uh, quite similar with the Anil sir. I think Anil sir is also going to talk on the same thing. So I, I will just touch a few important points on, only here. So what happens in intumescent cataract is there is a swollen lens and uh, it happens because of the liquefaction of the um, uh, cortical matter and there is a raised interlenticular pressure. And what happens as we enter in the make us uh, cut in an anti-capsule, suddenly there is a extension of uh, the axis towards the periphery and it happens because the whole of the nucleus moves forward because the liquid which is filled behind the nucleus pushes the whole of the bag uh, nucleus forward. So how can we control? Yeah. We can only control when we understand about the two important things. One is the horizontal vector and the second thing is the, no, the vertical vector. I, I'll skipping these slides. So vertical vector is surgeon's enemy and horizontal vector is our friend. Like in the normal case, case a vertical vector is this and the horizontal vector is through which we basically extend our, uh, we propagate our capsule axis. Uh, uh, am I audible to anyone? Yes, yes, you yeah. are audible. So what, what, is, what happens in the normal case? In normal scenario, the vertical vector is less because there is no ra raised interlenticular pressure and you, we can easily fill the chamber, anterior uh, antechamber and we can make the surface flatter and easily we can propagate the horizontal vector and we can uh, do our complete our axis. What happens in the raised interlenticular pressure? So as we enter it, because vertical vector is quite prominent here and it tears the uh, 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 axis towards the periphery. But if we control it with tightly filling the antechamber, so here the important thing is if what kind of viscoelastic you are using. So use uh, high viscosity viscoelastic only especially in the intumescent, intumescent cataracts where the chamber is shallow. So fill the antechamber tightly and make the anti-capsule flatter so that you can control the vertical vector, which is your enemy. Different kind of uh, decompression techniques uh, have been advocated. I think Anil sir will definitely tell about those things. So I'll just touch a uh, few important things like NDIAG laser use of NDIAG laser punctures needle ring compressions, FACO energy as uh, uh, Anand uh, has already shown a uh, failed uh, uh, FACO uh, puncture axis and the femtosecond, which is the latest one. ND, ND AG laser capsulotomy has been advocated a single puncture with high energy. Just 10 minutes prior to the surgery, you will get an ostium and uh, after uh, per op, just stain the capsule, you will get the ostium visible and through which some of the fluid leaks out and you can control it. But in some cases where the anti subcapsular plate is thick, it basically blocks the ostium and you will get the similar result what we guess get in other cases. Needle decompression have been advocated by Nabil. Here we basically put a 30 gauge needle bevel down and we 
enter in the capsule uh, and in the entire lenticular space and simultaneously we suck the fluid. But because now we are doing surgeries and performing surgeries under topical anesthesia, so we need the patient's help also because if patient moves the eye and if your hand is shaky, then again tear can extend towards the periphery. FACO energy, uh, uh, because uh, uh, Anant already has shown one uh, picture of uh, FACO, he tried uh, uh, FACO energy, the puncture axis, but it is not possible these days with the combination of horizontal and uh, torsional power. It was only possible with horizontal energy and it was possible with 2.8 uh, mm of uh, tips. With 2.2 millimeter of uh, tips, in majority of cases, if you try, definitely the rexes will extend if the gem, uh, pressure is quite raised. Femtosecond laser, again, you have to be very cautious, especially in cases of uh, intubation cataract, because sometimes you may get some additions and uh, uh, you won't get the free floating uh, capsule in all cases of uh, uh, intubation cataract. So you have to be cautious when you are removing the capsule, just check the additions and carefully snatch it and complete your uh, access. So I basically ad advocate a kind of baby rexis. In it, in this, I am doing, uh, uh, I told the uh, urban sir and uh, uh, in front of uh, Lalit sir that I did thousands and thousands cases with the, this technique successfully. Here I basically use high viscosity, viscoelastic uh, uh, vis um, visco and with a smaller opening, I fill tight the chamber tightly and I'll make a small, I'll create a small puncture in the center and I create a small circular opening without angel. I take care that uh, the, the fluid, flu the visco which is present in the chamber doesn't leak out. If it is leaking out, then again fill it. Try to make the anti capsule flatter as you can make it and then complete your excess and then decompression is very easy. You can use a blunt cannula through which you can just flush the um, fluid in the lenticular space and the uh, cortical matter along with the loose cortical matter will come out. Or personally, I use IA tip, slightly more exposed IA, IA tip and it uh, works well uh, in my all cases. So advantages is just to avoid Argentinian flag sign and it is more predictable than other techniques. And especially in my hands, I did thousands and thousands of cases successfully without any uh, problem and no extra cost is involved. Only you have to use, invest uh, some amount of, you know, extra amounts on the high viscosity viscoelastics. So if you and we understand the vertical vectors and horizontal vector, definitely we can uh, control it. Vertical vector, you have to control because that is our enemy and horizontal vector is our friend. We can definitely take a, its help to, you know, complete our access. Thank you very much, sir and ma'am. So thank you, Dr. Sudhir, again, for an excellent presentation and for all those practical tips on the vectors related to the Argentinian flag. Uh, before we uh, open this topic for discussion, there are a few questions which are there on the Facebook and YouTube from the previous presentation. And the first one is for Dr. Anantvi Jain. How much damage, uh, Dr. Siddharth Kotham wants to know, how much damage can be done to optic disc in glaucoma patients at high IOP in relation to IOP and surgery time? Uh, ma'am, this is a, uh, this, uh, this, you, this, uh, see, you cannot judge it, uh, but definitely there is a damage if you are working at high intraocular pressure. The, I think uh, that is well said, although we say that we should work at low IOP, but the, the actual damage by the high IOP has not been quantified or proven. Uh, in any of the cases, although, you know, we keep saying that you should work, your parameter should be low and you should work on low IOP. Then the second question is uh, by Dr. Khabia, how to bend Shermer without touching it? Shermer strip, how to bend it without touching it? So I think... Then, uh, uh, touching basically, in the, if you're touching with the finger, then definitely the oil which is present in your uh, finger can uh, contaminate and it can alter your reading. So you can use the tip of uh, uh, antibiotic eye drop to just bend it. So I do the same thing because I'll just uh, uh, open the bottle and I'll bend it with the tip of the bottle. And similarly, you can just put a drop of antibiotic and you can put in the uh, cul de sac. Okay. You can use the forcep also. You can use the forcep also. Yes. And uh, ma'am, I want to add one thing that it, uh, the uh, regarding the IOP depends on the duration of surgery also. If your duration of surgery is quite long, 
then uh, damage chances of damage of uh, especially in the glaucoma patients are more so if you are uh, making your surgery uh, fast and doing it finishing in a uh, few minutes time i think it is not going to uh, alter uh, much of your uh, means uh, sensors okay so i bottom, think that yes ma'am bottom line is that we should be near physiological yes so near physiological means if it is possible to do at a lower IOP that is less than 30 millimeter of mercury. It is really very much possible because I Dr. Harbunal said that in, we should reserve it for few cases, but for almost eight to 10 years, I'm using routinely in every case. The only problem is the normal time of surgery from eight minutes to 10 to 11 minutes. That is the only problem. Otherwise, there is no problem in any machine. Not only in these two machines. I routinely use Centurion and Signature and Borsonlong. But even in other machines also, it is possible to do at a low bottle height. It's not a big deal. Only the mindset is there. Mm -hmm. So we don't dare to do it. It is very much possible and gradually anybody can learn to reduce the height. If you're working at 120, start 100, after some time 80, after some time 50, then you will find that even at 30 or 32, you can do all kinds of cases. It will reduce the pain. The patient is very happy. It will reduce the pain and there are many un unseen problems. Like there might be some PPC behind the cataract. You are, you are not able to see that. There might be some other weaknesses. So at lower bottle height or lower IP, all these things will be managed okay. automatically. Then there is a question on when to start a high molecular weight tear substitute. And I think I will project the slide because this is a very tricky question. And it took us a lot of time to you know, decipher as to what to use, when to use, and when to stop. So I think... If it is a mild dry eye, you start with 0.5% uh, CMC or 0.3% HPMC or a carbomere. If it becomes moderate, then you add polyols plus minus gelling agents. If it becomes severe, then 1% CMC or hyaluronic acid. And if it is very severe, still not responding, then you combine uh, any of the two agents of different categories. So you can combine a polyol with a uh, hyaluronic acid. Uh, then, of course, one has to be totally preservative-free and ointments and gels have to be given. And when do you say it's working or not working? You should give, uh, ideally, uh, uh, ideally, you should give an interval of about 15 days to say, you know, whether one particular type of lubricant is working or not working. So I think we, with this, we come to the end of the questions and uh, now we will move on to the next uh, talk. Mm -hmm. The next talk is going to be given by Dr. Manish. Uh, can you please uh, share yeah. your slides? He's going to be talking about, uh, he's going to be talking to us about uh, a very important topic and also uh, a topic which is not, uh, which is really not uh, discussed too much. Uh, we talk about cornea, we talk about lens, then we talk about retina, we talk about angle, but iris is, you know, one thing which we don't talk about, then he's going to be talking about it. Can we have the presentation? Yes, ma'am, just, just a minute. Tackling iris issues, I think, is a... Uh, yes. Is a, Iris uh, is a thing, you know, which has also become um, uh, focus of uh, many anterior segment surgeons. Um, so uh, over to Manish. Uh, just a minute, ma'am, just... Uh... If we can see it, Manish, you just have to put it on slideshow, otherwise it is perfect. So you can begin from, uh, from, from beginning slideshow, I think from beginning. Uh, you need to put just, it in slideshow, sir. Yeah, yeah, I'm just doing that. Bottom right, uh, next to the... Yeah, yeah, it's actually covered by the... Uh, Achha, you can't see. I can't see it. Yeah. You can press F5 if you can. Function 5. Yeah. 
just just a second so there was a question on youtube which i have already answered and this it said that there is uh, dr kiranjit singh uh, you know talked about uh, some kind of nasal drops that have been introduced which are supposed to cure dry eye so uh -huh. There is an intranasal device by the name of True Tear, which comes again by Alargan, and I have no financial or conflict of interest. So that was something which was used to treat dry eye. Manish, it was very, it was coming out very nicely. What okay. Happened? Uh, yeah, you were perfect. Uh, no. Yes. Can you can you can you see it now? Yes, we can see it now. Am I audible? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, a uh, very good evening to all of you. And uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the AIS for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk on the topic of uh, tackling iris uh, issues. I would also like to congratulate uh, uh, Dr. Lalit Verma, sir, Dr. Harvan Shlal, uh, Namrita ma'am, and uh, Dr. Rajesh Sina for you know organizing this uh, uh, wonderful webinar and starting the UP chapter masterclass. So uh, uh, you know, congratulations to uh, all of you. So uh, my topic is slightly different for, from what the other uh, you know, speakers have presented. And um, I will be dealing uh, with how to tackle these uh, iris issues. Now, uh, we all know that the pupil uh, has diverse anatomical and functional implications for a range of uh, clinical situations. And uh, when we are dealing with cases like complicated cataract surgery, trauma, congenital dysgenesis, coloboma, zytrogenic iris defects, the pupil becomes deformed, it becomes uh, uh, you know, deshaped. And uh, these irregular uh, pupils would lead to a lot of symptoms. The patients would complain of glare, photophobia, monocular uh, diplopia. So uh, we need to deal with all these issues. Uh, not all uh, iris uh, defects need to be repaired. If you are dealing with a small iris defect, if it's a small arachidolysis, which is present in the uh, superior quadrant and it is covered by the, uh, the lid margins and the patient is asymptomatic, so we can just leave it. There's no need to go forward and you know uh, operate upon such patients. But if we have a deformed uh, cornea and uh, the, the patient has uh, symptoms of glare, monocular diplopia, photophobias, and he's complaining a lot, then of course uh, we should address his complaints and we should uh, go and repair it for functional as well as, as well as for cosmetic values. So the major categories uh, would include the um, aradodialysis, which usually occurs because of the uh, blunt trauma, which can occur by you know, any, any blunt uh, instruments or a tennis ball or a golf ball injuries, uh, where we can also, uh, go and repair such uh, you know, pupils which have traumatic midriasis because of these finger tears, atonic pupils, traumatic or congenital aniridias uh, need to be you know, surgically dealt as they have a lot of uh, visual as well as a uh, lot of cosmetic value. So I'll be demonstrating some of my surgical techniques here. Now, this was a case of a subluxated traumatic cataract with a traumatic midriasis. And as you can see here, there's a, uh, a subluxation. So I stain the anterior capsule with the tripine blue and using my utrata forceps, I'm now doing the capsular axis. Whenever you are dealing with these subluxated cataracts, the anterior capsule is very elastic and it's a little difficult to do the capsular axis in these cases. And uh, since we had a subluxation, so I'm uh, implanting a CTR, a capsular tension ring, so as to stabilize the back. And doing a slow motion phaco emulsification, you can appreciate that the cataract is pretty soft. This was followed by uh, irrigation aspiration, and then the uh, implantation of the lens. And after this was done, um, I used a ninoproline suture and I passed it through the limbus. Now I take a bite to the proximal end of the iris defect, and then I move forward and take a bite in the distal end of the iris defect and then externalize it to the other side of the limbus. As you can see here. Now using the uh, McPherson forcep, I now pull the uh, loop of the suture and I'm tying it inside the eye in, and there with the loop and the suture and I tie and using my uh, vitreoretinal forceps. And it is quite cumbersome when you're doing this technique. And uh, finally, I'm able to tie the knot and then the ends of the uh, suture ends are cut. And you can see that I have a relatively uh, round pupil. 
So this was the pre-operative, uh, you know, uh, picture of the, of the patient and post-operatively we have a relatively round pupil. Now, after doing that case, I thought about that because it was very cumbersome. And then I shifted to another technique, a novel technique, which is known as a single pass four throat pupilloplasty. It was uh, first advocated by Dr. Amar Agarwal, and I found it very interesting. And I'll show you an animation of this so that you can get a concept. And then I'll show you my surgical video. Now here, what we do is we take an inoproline protein suture with a long needle and pass it through the uh, limbus and then take a bite in the proximal iris defect. And then using a 26 gauge needle, we pass it through the distal defect and then uh, we uh, do a, rail, a railroad technique and externalize the suture. And then we go inside and take the suture in a loop form and externalize it. Now the suture end is passed through this loop and we give four throws. We give four throws and after these throws are given, the end of the suture, both the ends of the sutures are now pulled and watch carefully, the pupil becomes round. Here you see the pupil gets round. And then the edges of the uh, sutures are cut and you have a relatively round pupil. So you can do it infrequently also. So now this was my case uh, where I, I used this technique. I stained the entire capsule with the uh, tripan glue. And uh, after doing my uh, capsular excess, I did a direct phaco chop technique here. I impaled the nucleus, cracked the nucleus into multiple fragments, and then slowly each fragment was uh, emulsified. And this was followed by uh, automated irrigation aspiration and then the implantation of the intraocular lens. Now, once this lens was implanted, I injected intracambial pyrocalcrine to constrict the pupil. And now, uh, using my uh, long needle linopoline suture, I passed it through the limbus and took a peripheral bite in the uh, proximal part of the iris defect, as you can see here. I passed it through the uh, proximal defect. And then, using my uh, 26 gauge needle, I passed it through the main incision, took a bite in the distal end of the iris defect. And now using a railroad technique, I passed this nine, the needle of the nino suture through the lumen of the 26 gauge. See how I am threading it here. And now slowly withdraw it and externalize it to my main incision there. Now, once this is done, the next thing I did was I used my Sinsky hole went in through my main incision and pulled the suture which was inside in a loop, in a loop fashion there. I am using my uh, McPherson faucet and I externalized this loop. And now once this loop is externalized here, now you can see now I will cut the other suture end to make it slightly small and now pass this suture through the loop and I will give four throws. So this was, the first throw, and it is important to give this uh, four throws so that I have a, a tight knot and I have a round pupil. So the, this is the uh, second throw. And this is followed by the uh, third throw. You can actually count each throws. And then finally, the last throw, the fourth throw. Now, once these four throws are given, I will now pull both the ends of the suture. And you have to watch the pupil. Watch the pupil carefully. As I am passing, as I am pulling both the uh, sutures ends, you see how the pupil becomes round. As I pass, as I am pulling it on both the sides, the pupil gets round. See how round it has become. And now once this is done, I go in with my uh, vitreous scissors and cut the edge of the uh, knot, hydrate the side coat and the main incision, and we have a nice round pupil. So this was the preoperative uh, picture of the patient. And uh, after the surgery, the pupil has become absolutely round. So uh, I would now move on to another uh, uh, defect that is the aerodialysis and how to repair these cases. We all know that uh, uh, our aerodialysis is basically an avulsion of the iris from its natural insertion on the ciliary body. And that might be accidental or iatrogenic in nature. 
Now, whenever we are dealing with these cases of blunt trauma, which have our dialysis, which are, we should also watch for the zonular dialysis also, because in these cases, you might have these dialysis uh, along with, uh, you know, our dialysis, there can be a zonular dialysis, and that makes the surgery more challenging, more complicated. So, uh, you know, a pre-operative evaluation is very important. Also important is the timing of the surgery. Now, whenever these cases present, they, they are, you know, they, are, they have blunt trauma, they have severe inflammation, severe uveitis with high FEMA, they might have secondary glaucoma. So you have to quieten the eye. You have to manage this with uh, use steroids, uh, topical steroids, oral steroids, control the intraocular pressure, make the eye quiet and then perform the surgery. Also, we should not wait too long to perform the surgery here because if we wait, uh, quite a long time, then the iris tissue becomes very fragile. They become very fibrotic and then to suture them becomes very, very difficult. So we should be very judicious and you should, you know, we should neither be very aggressive in managing them surgically, nor we should take too long for managing. So I will be showing you uh, the handbag technique here. Now what uh, we do here is basically we make a stab incision and we pass uh, we take a, a double arm nylon, uh, double armed uh, proline suture, and we pass the long needle through the uh, uh, stab incision and take a peripheral bite, and then we externalize it through the uh, scleral incision that we make here. And then the other end of the nylon proline suture is again passed through the stab incision adjacent to the initial bite that we had taken, and then externalize it through the scleral incision. Now, once this is done, we pull both the needles and then we tie both the sutures and the knots are then embedded in these scleral incisions and the iris gets opposed to its root and we have a round pupil, as you can see. Now, I'll be showing you the surgical technique here. The, you can see this is a, an iris dialysis and I make a stab incision and I'm just uh, inserting two, uh, I'm inserting an iris hooks and widening the pupil to get a, a much broader view here. And then I perform my capsular excess. And after that, uh, we also noticed that there was a, a small dialysis. So I implanted a CTR to stabilize the bag. And this was followed by uh, emulsification of the new, it was a pretty soft nucleus. So we did a, a FACO emulsification, which was followed by a, again, and uh, removal of the cortex, and then the implantation of the uh, lens. Now, after implanting the lens, uh, we remove the uh, hooks, and now I'm doing a conjunctival uh, peritomy, and uh, I'm making uh, two small scleral incision adjacent to the uh, aerodialysis, about uh, two millimeters away from the uh, limbus, and two scleral pockets are made. And then the nino-proline suture, the needle of it is passed through. We take a peripheral bite and externalize it through this scleral incision. The other end of the uh, needle is again taken and passed through the peripheral part of the iris defect, externalized, as you can see here. And now I will pull both the ends of the needle. Now, since this defect was uh, larger, so I use another uh, double arm nino-proline suture passed it again through the other part of the uh, defect, passed it through the peripheral part of the iris defect, and then externalized it through the scleral incision in a similar fashion and pulled both the uh, needles so that to oppose the iris there. And once this is done, I'll suture the ends of both the ends of the sutures the knots are then buried in this scleral tunnel. And there you see you have a round uh, pupil. There, it, it is relatively round. So this was the uh, day one picture. And uh, after a week's period, we have a white eye with a round pupil. This is the pre-operative picture and uh, we have the post-operative picture. Now, after doing this case, again, I thought about to make it a little more simpler. And then I, I, I came up upon a technique, uh, which is the modified sewing machine technique. And it's a wonderful technique. And uh, I will again show you an animation of it to get to understand the concept. And then I will show my surgical video. 
Now we take a 26 gauge needle here and pass uh, the needle of an ionopolyne suture through the lumen and leave a small tag in front of the 26 gauge. Now we make a scleral tunnel adjacent to the aerodialysis about two millimeters from it. We make a, uh, make a main incision, the keratome, and using my uh, 26 gauge needle in which we had the ninoproline suture, I take a peripheral bite of the iris aerodialysis tissue and then externalize it and pull the suture. Now slowly I will now withdraw this and again take a peripheral bite and now I will externalize the loop. Again, in a similar manner, you take a bite and then externalize another loop. Depending upon the uh, how big the uh, aerodialysis is, you can do it as many times and you have this loop. Now, once you have these loops, what you do now is you take out the, you pull out the suture, the proline suture from the lumen of the 26 gauge and, and withdraw it along with the needle. And then you pass that needle through the loops. And then once you pass it through the loops, you pull both the ends of the sutures and you get a round pupil. And I'll show you in my surgical video here. Now this was a traumatic uh, mature cataract to the aerodialysis. I stained the uh, anterior capsule with trypan blue and doing my capsule of excess. And I followed, it's pretty soft here, did my fecal emulsification, then removed the cortex. And uh, now I do a conjunctival peri peritomy. And now I make a scleral incision about two millimeters away from the limbus. You can see here. And uh, now the next step is to take the 26 gauge needle and uh, dock the uh, needle of the uh, ninoproline suture into the lumen of the 26 gauge. As you can see here, I insert it here. And now through the other end of the uh, 26 gauge needle, I pull the needle and I withdraw it till a small tag of a suture is left in front of the needle. Now this 26 gauge needle is passed through inside through the main incision and a peripheral bite is taken uh, of the iris defect. And then this is externalized through the, through the scleral incision. And then the suture is pulled forward here. Now slowly I will withdraw my 26 gauge needle and then take another peripheral bite adjacent to the first one. See, I take another peripheral bite adjacent to the next one and then externalize it to the scleral incision. And again, in a similar fashion, I do it again and take these three loops here. Depending upon the defect, you can do it as many times as you want. And now I have these three, uh, these loops here. Now I will slowly pull the suture from the lumen of the 26 gauge. And as I'm doing so, see the needle of the proline suture comes out. Now I will slowly withdraw the 26 gauge needle and now I will pass it through the loop that I have created and pull both the ends of the suture. And as I do so, you see the pupil gets rounded. See, you have a nice round pupil here and the knots are embedded in this little tunnel. This is followed by injection of the, int the intraocular lens. We could have also implanted the lens initially. That's uh, not a concern. And then the conjunctiva is cauterized and uh, you have a nice round pupil here. So this is uh, day one. You have a relatively round pupil. In fact, uh, if the pupil is still not, not uh, very round, what you can do is uh, you can do a pupiloplasty here. You can do a single pass four to pupiloplasty here and make the pupil more round. So this is the uh, pre-operative picture and this is the post-operative uh, picture of the patient. So to conclude, uh, iris repair can be very rewarding both for the surgeon as well as for the patients. And there are of course multiple techniques to uh, manage these cases and those I've already shown you. And uh, you can go in and do, do any technique of your, uh, you know, whatever you desire. And uh, if the case is, you know, if you have a larger defect and if it's uh, pretty large, then of course uh, you can even use prosthetic devices. There are wonderful devices which are available. And, uh, and now human optics has also come up with an artificial uh, iris, which actually you can, uh, you know, uh, inject it and implant it over the sulcus. And it gives a very round pupil and helps elevate the patient's symptoms and as well as gives a, a good cosmetic value to the patient. Thank you.
Thank you, Manish. I think that was an excellent presentation. Uh, the best part is that you explain everything so patiently. Otherwise, uh, normally when these techniques are shown, you know, they are so fast that it becomes difficult to concentrate. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. But uh, you were really wonderful with your uh, explanations. And every single word that you said was being followed up by the action. So everything became very clear which suture to pull and where. Otherwise, you know, you get... Uh, uh, you get lost in the sutures and uh, the needles and you don't know which one to pull. Uh, sir, uh, Dr. Harbans Lal, sir, would you want to come? I, I think, uh, Namada, you put it very correctly. I think very nicely depicted and very easy to understand. But of course, whenever there is a large hydrodialysis, the, the pupil is going to be eccentric because you are not going to hit the root. It will be one millimeter away from that. So it's a good idea to do the pupiloplasty, uh, one, uh, one suture over there, will make it far more central. But otherwise, overall, very well demonstrated. Well done. Thank and you. You can also use 10 O sutures. I mean, 10 O proline also. That is absolutely fine for these type of surgery because mm -hmm. uh, sooner or later, they will form additions over there. So I just mm -hmm. really stick over there. So even if it is a 10 O, which is finer than that, uh, you can mm -hmm. use it. And you should not use 30 gauze needle. Because I don't know whether 28 is available or not, because these uh, uh, proline does not pass, this proline needle does not pass through the 30 gauze needle once or twice. I try to choose the 30 gauze needle because 26 is a little too traumatic. So mm -hmm. I think if we can get something in between, maybe 29, 28, that will be better. Definitely. Yes. It's a little, you know, cumbersome doing these surgeries, but once you, you do it and uh, it's very rewarding. I mean, you feel quite satisfied. So, uh, initial few cases, you should do it. Uh, like whenever I started doing it earlier, that will be the only case in the OT. So I will not keep it with my own routine list so that I'm not in a hurry and I'm not in a tension. I'm not in a hurry to finish the list. So I'll just keep it a standalone case on that day. Once you get used to it and it becomes routine for you, then you can actually club it with your routine OT. Mm -hmm. So once in a while, I tried to club it with the routine OT. I could not finish this surgery because I was getting irritated. So, so it's taking too long and there are 10 cases waiting for you. So I think when you start doing it, keep it a stand alone, single case, so that you are just absolutely relaxed. For that matter, any whether it's a glued IUL or scleral picture, whatever you are doing new, I think that day you should have enough of time. That's very true, sir. I always tell, you know, my counselor, you, you don't have to post such cases when, when we have a list. So when if you want to post them, just give me one or two cases. That's it. That's and, and yeah, that, that's a good suggestion, sir. Thank you. With this, we come to the last talk. Uh, yeah. And this is going to be given by none other than Dr. Anil Srivastava, who we know uh, is a very accomplished FACO surgeon. And he's going to talk about uh, how I do, how can we have your slides, please? So he is going to talk about how I do capsulorexis in intumescent cataracts. So it's really uh, heartening to know that we have a, a huge amount of people uh, on the YouTube and Facebook, I think, because this is the first on the platform of AIOS uh, headquarters. That is why after many days, an excellent set of uh, presentations by the UP chapter uh, on the masterclass on FACO emulsification. So, Dr. Shavastav, sir. Thank you, Dr. Namuta, Dr. Harvan sir, and everyone for giving me this opportunity. A lot of things are already dealt, so I will go very brief and to the point what I want to say. See, in intermission cataract, the biggest problem is intracapsular pressure. And in every case, it is too high. To counter it, and Dr. Sudhir advised very correctly that we can use OVD and lesser <clears throat> incision size should be lesser so that there will be lesser leakage to maintain the counter pressure. And at the same time, you can reduce the speculum size that will also reduce the pressure. But in spite of all these things, you must have noticed that whether you are doing with the femto or FECO or needle, sometimes the moment you touch it, it runs. So what happens? That sometimes it doesn't run, and sometimes 
it runs and it, it is so fast that you can't do anything so the basic reason is that and sometimes even you complete almost 60 to 80% like in this in the second picture you can see you have completed almost 60 to 70% and then it just starts burning then what happens because already you have decompressed it already 60% rexus is completed even then what happens that in the journey suddenly it starts running so that is the key points where we want to understand then probably it will not happen see this is the dr sudhir technique but even in this you have to make a puncture the moment you make a puncture so that is the key point once that is successfully done that first puncture and it doesn't run then you can make a smaller rexes bigger rexes onion peel whatever you want to do so the culprit is if you see with the slit lamp you will find some pockets see there are multiple radial pockets and at some places there are no pockets so luckily if you puncture in these places where no pockets it will not run but if you puncture in the area of localized pockets there are the localized zones of very intense iop intense intracapsular pressure in these area if you puncture it will run or even you will start in a safer zone and you are coming and the moment you reach to this zone it will run away so how to handle very simple after doing naturally these white cases requires staining and then you put visco but it is it is simple visco or high quality obd you can make with any kind of obd so the point is just to massage it little bit with the visco needle with this massage there are the multiple pockets they will become one pond one pocket and if the fluid becomes single pool and then you pressurize with the visco and then there is no localized pocket then there will be no burst there will be no burst during the journey of the rexis and it will make the life very simple once you have sucked a little bit fluid from the capsule it will become very obedient so the few simple steps are reduce pressure on eyeball by reducing the speculum opening after staining fill the chamber with cmc or sodium hyaluronate i always use simple cmc gentle massage of visco cannula over anterior capsule to break pockets and make a single pond of fluid overfill with the visco and then puncture with the 26 gauge needle bevel down to avoid capturing of the capsule and suck fluid now it is an obedient capsule you can make ccc easily both the problems should be solved so in the central zone it will not run even in the journey it will not run so with the video uh, see what about in those 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 zones which are having these lacunae or pockets just massage them and they will become homogeneous single lake of fluid and just puncture and suck a little bit refill the visco again
So it is not only the intracapsular pressure, because you have noticed that in morganin Morgan cataract or in lens induced globum, in hypermajor cataract with the LIG, so there are no loculi, but the pressure is intense. Even then, there is no case of running or Argentinian sign in those cases. Because the whole cortex becomes almost liquid. So there are no localized pockets. Like, like this case. In this case, there is no localized pocket. Although the overall IP is high, internal capsular pressure is high, but in, in these cases, you can do the access very safely. You will never find any case where it, it will run. The simple reason is the whole liquid is in one point. So I, I rest my talk here just for the discussion that CCC in these cases become accidental only because of the localized pressure. We have to handle that very simply by massaging. And then I don't think there'll be any case where there will be runaway either to begin with or in the journey. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Anil Srivastava, sir, for that excellent talk. And I think uh, we have answered all the questions which were there on the Facebook and on the uh, on the YouTube. And there are a lot of congratulatory messages, especially from the people who are watching from UP and all over uh, the country. And now, if there are any questions or any comments uh, uh, from the from the speakers, uh, Dr. Harbans Lal, sir, if you're there. Uh, you could you would like to uh, uh, give some comments and uh, dr sudhir what would you want to say because your topic was similar to dr anil shavasta and namrata ma'am that's the beauty of medical science you know uh, you'll get uh, tips from everyone like uh, anil sir said that you massage it so that you will you'll break the loculi so that there is a one you know bolus of fluid and it leaks out uh, without creating damage and similarly, if you tightly fill the antechamber and make the anti-capsule flatter again, because it is not pushed by the, uh, uh, the nucleus, uh, uh, because there is a nucleus, uh, forward movement of nucleus, if you control that, again, you will control the rexis. And uh, uh, leaking means uh, aspirating uh, the uh, lenticular space, again, creates a, in a re de decrease in lenticular pressure, then you can extend, propagate your rexis easily. So you'll get tips from everywhere. That's the beauty of medical science because it's not the book thing that you won't get uh, everything written in the books. So you experience, and that's the beauty that Anil sir has vast experience of, you know, a cataract. I think he must have done thousands, uh, lakhs of cataracts. So these things are, uh, whenever we get uh, these kind of in, uh, interactions and webinar, we'll get messages, which is not there in the medical books. Mm -hmm. Quite right. right. I think you say that, you know, sometimes one expert tells you a thing which you cannot, uh, which you don't know, even if you read the 3000 pages of a book. So if he just gives you a tip in this step of massaging from the area where the uh, uh, locules are present or from the area where, you know, those visible areas are present is again a new tip uh, which uh, he has given. So there are uh, different ways of doing the same thing. Ma'am, another one small point I would like to uh, say here that although it's very small, but if you loosen the speculum, if you release the pressure, that's also plays a very important role in, you know, uh, when you're making, when you're about to make the rexes. So uh, sometimes we just, you know, we have our uh, speculums, which are very, very tight and they also increase the pressure. So you lower the speculum and you know, that lowers the pressure and then you can go ahead with these cases. Quite right, sir. Uh, Dr. Harmanslal, sir. Dr. Yeah, actually, uh, what uh, Dr. Anil Srivastava talked, actually, I've been doing it for more than a year now. It really works very well. So just uh, instead of uh, kindly, I use the RS repository 
in fact the instrument used for the smile level looking for that type of instrument that would be far better to massage and once in a while i did rupture the capsule while doing the massage itself but otherwise overall it sounds well to reduce the ventricular pressure uh, one thing i would like to add, add ma'am that while aspirating what i do is i connect the needle with the feco uh, aspiration port and aspirate it with the uh, uh, so that uh, my hand is stable, I don't uh, pull it, uh, put it at the back of the syringe. So I, I spread it with the help of foot paddle. Just uh, make the mode of FACO to irrigation aspiration. And aspiration can be done by the, uh, this, uh, uh, the by pressing the foot paddle. So there will be no movement uh, while aspirating the... Uh, I normally don't aspirate at all, actually. I just do the massage and do the rexis. I do not aspirate. In fact, the asp aspiration has been emphasized so much. Okay, another day, my resident was operating. I saw his video and he was aspirating while there was no fluid. He kept on aspirating. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> thought that in a hypermature cataract, you should aspirate, you should aspirate. So in a white mature cataract, I saw that he's aspirating for five minutes from different, different quarters. Mm -hmm. There's nothing, there's no fluid. <laughs> so I think we have been over emphasizing the aspiration all the time. And that itself can cause the rexus to run away. And so sometimes there's, 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 you don't, don't have really too much emphasize upon the aspiration. Once you make the opening, opening in the food which has to come, it will come out of its own. And since sometimes, sir, when you are aspirating also accidentally, the tag of the uh, anterior capsule may also get stuck uh, in sir, the... I don't believe in aspiration at all whatsoever. <laughs> I mean, people... <laughs> I don't believe in it. There is a question for you, Manish. Uh, uh, why only four throws? Why can't it be just three throws? <laughs> That's a good question. But I think four throws is basically to make the knot tight. And so just so that, you know, you have a very tight and the suture does not loosen up. And then you have a round pupil. Actually, the Amargawal and others have done this study because if the, there are three uh, so, uh, throws, it may slip actually not. And uh, five will be even stronger. But four are just adequate. So it should not be less than four. It could be more than four. You can do it five. But then uh, four are just adequate. Just adequate. So they have like done even where there were not no suturing was done in a scleral fixated. They did the five pass in the sclera and leave the suture over there without knot. You don't have to make any pocket and just have the five passes into the sclera and five loops into the sclera and it won't slip. Well, so it's a, if you have to lock down someone, give four packs off, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much. I think we've had a great session, excellent talks and very nice uh, videos uh, which highlighted everything. Congratulations, UP chapter, for uh, being first our opening batsman. Uh, and uh, we would like to thank Largan for supporting this uh, event. Uh, uh, we would like to thank our audiovisual team, uh, Mr. Sunil, who's uh, ever efficient and has done a brilliant job. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, sir, would you like to say something at the conclusion? Well, either, thank you for a wonderful session. I think uh, well done. And thank you. on time, that's the best part of it. Yeah. Thank you. And I'm really pleasantly surprised to see the number of people who have logged in. Uh, you all should also go and see the Facebook and the YouTube to see how many views are there. I'm think, I, I think they will keep increasing as the time goes by. And uh, this is for the archives on the AIOS platform. It is going to be there for all those who missed out the earlier part of it. So thank you, everyone. And thank you, Alargan. Thank you, Mr. Kripal Rana and AIOS headquarter team for organizing this.